a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, Laura Van Tyne. She is the author of the new book, Soul Tribe, which will, of course, be linked down in the show notes as well as her website. So you guys just go check that out and go find her. Uh, she is a remote viewer. She specializes in crossing over, parasitic implant removal, etheric medicine, quantum healing hypnosis, my lab recovery via regression therapy and soul retrieval, as well as much, much more. She is fascinating. We had an incredible conversation. So, without any further ado, Laura Van Tyne. All right, guys, very, very excited to welcome Laura Van Tyne on the show. How are you today, Laura? I am fantastic, as you are, I'm sure. I, I am fantastic. Ouch outstanding extraordinary anything that you want to say it's all good vibes over here we are both uh, just a couple of high frequency beings about to have a fantastic conversation and i'm very much looking forward to it so if you don't mind for my audience that doesn't know about you uh just explain just a little bit about yourself and tell us about your work well i my company is the karmic path and i got my start one morning when our youngest daughter woke up extremely psychic and all of a sudden our house was filled with all kinds of beings and entities at the time that I couldn't see, but my daughter could see, and they're communicating with her. And as a parent, what do you do about that? And we started living literally a house of horrors. I mean, it would make a Hollywood horror flick seem like pale in comparison. It was so bad. And I ended up quitting my job as a public school teacher. And I had to figure out literally how to save my family's soul because all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a spiritual war that I didn't know existed. And having said that, karma never wastes energy. And because of those experiences, I am now able to help others who are in a similar predicament. You've got an incredible story. I, Like I said, I, I have seen some stuff from your website uh, that Judy sent me over, and it is fascinating. Uh, your, your talk on Super Shoulder specifically was very, very interesting. So um, it's my understanding also that you used to be a teacher. Yeah, I taught middle school math and Spanish for a long time. And then I taught um, Spanish immersion at the elementary school. I, I never went below the third grade, though, because they started scaring me. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> they leak everywhere. The little ones leak everywhere. <laughs> right, right. That makes sense, actually. Yeah, well, uh, so, ¿tú hablas español? Sí. Oh, bueno, qué bueno. Sí, bastante bien. Era mejor en, en el pasado. Y viví en Tetán por algunos meses y un, un año más o menos. Muy bien. Well, we'll switch yeah. back to English for uh, my English listening uh, audience. But uh, the Spanish Spanish folks out there, uh, thank you so much. So, puerta te bien que nada te cuesta. Very good. Uh, well, good deal. Um, okay, so your book, Soul Tribe, I want to get to, but I do just want to kind of cover a couple of topics that you um, cover with your work that you do here. So, um, you're a remote viewer, which is great, because I'm thinking Psychic Warrior, I'm thinking Pat Price, I'm thinking, you know, Russell Targan, those guys. Uh, any, is there similarities in the work that they did and the kind of things that you're able to do? So, my remote viewing abilities came about naturally. Um and I study a lot. So I am able to project my consciousness to any time, space, and location. A lot of times somebody will hire me to clear their haunted home. And when I'm doing that, I'm looking at, and this is where technology is great because I can Google the address, see a picture of the house, and then I can sink back into it and I remote view the house, but I'm going through stacks of time because time is not necessarily linear, but I'm going through stacks of time, remote viewing, psychic vision, whatever you want to call it, looking for what I would call the offending agents, although it's usually ghosts or maybe a portals or dark entities. 
And there can be several different problems within a home that the people living there are experiencing. So it's really important to take your time to kind of sift through all of that. So when I'm remote viewing, I'm going through and I always cross over all of the dead that I find. I never leave a soldier behind because every soul needs to go home. This is kind of a little bit of a misconception, I think, that we've been taught all of our lives is that, oh, they deserve to rot in hell or, oh, um, they deserve what they get. But no matter how a person lives or dies, they need to go home. When we leave this physical body, well, these bodies are like rental units. We don't take them with us. This houses our soul. Our soul is inside of here. And so when we leave this shell, where does the soul go? Well, we live in the third dimension. This is the dimension of physicality. We can see, touch, hear, smell, taste. When we leave this, we go to the fourth dimension. And originally it was supposed to be a sort of a step up transformer. So we go from the third dimension to the fourth dimension to the fifth dimension and above as we transition back home. But something happened along the way. The Luciferic forces, when they fell from the light of God, from the grace of God, they had to go somewhere. And we always hear about Lucifer and this and that. And Lucifer comes in many shapes and flavors, okay? It can be a reptilian, it can be whatever. So, but when they fell from the light of God, nobody ever says, well, where did they go and how are they getting their energy or their food source? No one asked that question. And through my work, through all these years of doing this, I've been able to put the pieces of the puzzle together. When the Luciferic forces fell, they left the fifth dimension and above, and they went down to the fourth dimension. For them, it's a step down transformer. So they're now in the fourth dimension and they're getting hungry and they need an energy source. They no longer have access to the light of God, creator, so whatever your term is. They don't have access to that energy source. So what are they going to do? Well, we've got these humans that are light beings going from the third to the fourth to the fifth. What if we just sort of put a net over that fourth dimension and we capture as many souls as we can and we utilize their energy? And this is why we have the concept of ghosts. Ghosts exist throughout the history of this planet, throughout culture, throughout time. Every culture has a word for ghost, angels and demons. Why is that if they don't exist? So now we have been programmed by these dark entities to think certain things. Well, they just deserve to go to hell, right? So if they deserve to go to hell, we're not going to save their soul. And the dark side I have learned through the, my work reincarnates souls just as the light side does. We don't live just one mortal lifetime. The dark side will also reincarnate these souls onto this planet when they see fit. When they do this, that soul does not have the ability afforded to them of soul healing, soul restoration, repairs, nor do they have the ability to have um, guidance, counsels of divine wisdom, and et cetera, addressing the mortal life just lived. So when they come back here, they come back here with a piece of their soul shaved off, a piece broken off, more and more broken each time. And it's now, be, we're at a critical point right now. We have to change the way we do business. And, you know, I get, I get asked all the time, well, what about somebody like Jeffrey Epstein? Surely he doesn't deserve to go to heaven, right? Or the heavens or the higher realms. Well, we know the fourth dimension impacts the third dimension all the time. We know ghost energy comes through to the third dimension all the time. We know these dark forces come through to the third dimension all the time. How many times have we seen some dark shadow go across our face through the corner of our eye? What was that? Well, if it was a dark shadow, it probably wasn't your angelic support team. So what is that? So along those ways, we have to really think about every soul needs to cross over no matter how they lived or died. And when we cross them over, the higher realm beings now have access to that soul. They are not roaming around in that fourth dimension. 
That was a big chunk, I know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's great. I'm I'm with you on all of it. And and I do have some specific questions. So before we move on, I just want to ask you a few things. So I do think that it's interesting whenever you clear a home, no soldier left behind. It's kind of like a spiritual underground railroad. I like what you do there with that about the transportation of souls. I think that's fascinating. Um, something I'm also very interested in is what you said about sustenance and that entities of all shapes and sizes need a form of sustenance of some kind. Now, is that just simply because they're separate from source in this way whenever you trickle down through the dimensions because what are we are we talking just 12 dimensions or 11 here with your understanding you know it, 11 or 12 there's different theories about different things I, you know i'm not going to get hung up on how many exactly um everything is energy everything has a vibration everything has a frequency everything needs a fuel source of some sort self-perpetuating or otherwise the higher realms is a very high vibration energy source they've been cut off they need to do something else and oh apologies go ahead oh no i was just, I was just gonna say and so where did they what did they do they got creative they found some humans and we're not the only planet that they've done this to. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. And and just the whole concept of being separated from source is something I'm fascinated by. Because like I said before we started here, I've, I've been on a bit of spiritual journey um, for like 20 years now. So I've, I've spoken to a lot of interesting people. I've read a lot of books. Uh, and just to the idea that there's, you know, this duality here. But I thought, like I said, it was it's my understanding uh, that it's just a duality in the third dimension so therefore but it would it would check out that as you go up there's going to be dichotomy no matter what level you go to except for when you return to source and that's kind of higher consciousness at 11 or 12 or whatever whatever dimension like you said not getting hung up on the on the numbers there but um one of the things that is interesting to me is in in my searching i've i've found folks that say well you know it's we're all source you know kind of like the neil donald walsh conversations with god idea that we're all source we're we're just individualistic expressions of it if you follow that uh have you ever heard of the egg that short story no. Okay. It's fascinating. So basically, uh, and it was turned into a small little 10 minute animation thing or whatever, but it was a story that was written and it's just kind of an idea about what this reality is and that it's just basically a training ground for us to be a God someday. So we're basically, this is, this place has us in spiritual training wheels, if you will. And, and it kind of says in that, that there's nobody else. There's just God and us here and all other human beings on this planet are individualistic reincarnations of this, of you, of me. Like I'm you, right. you're me. And then there's God and that's it. Um, to that point though, it would seem interesting that there's kind of a benevolent force or a malevolent force out there that is battling in, in a certain way that's cut off from source and that has access to affect us. This is the part that I find interesting about source letting or allowing or permitting a negative oh, entity. I have had conversations with my spiritual team about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. What's their answer for this? Um, essentially, they, the higher realms were curious as to how this would play out. And they just sort of went hands off. Because the other factor we have is the concept that we have free will. When we're in this mortal body, we have free will, right? Yeah. The ability to make choices based on our environment and the actions and reactions around us. However, when we are being puppeted by a malevolent force, is our free will mitigated free will? It's a great question. Right? It, yeah. it really is. And and I look at this and I had a client who called me, her 18-year-old college daughter, and by the way, I'm very much abiding by spiritual law. I never remote view a property or location without permission. Um, I never will work on a person without permission. If a parent is calling me about their minor child, I can work on that minor child. This girl was 18 years old and a college student, and her mom called me because she came home one day from college for spring break or somewhere. And the, the daughter told the mom, she goes, there's something wrong with me because I keep hearing voices in my head telling me to kill my sister. And 
the mom and the dad talked about it for a while and they were debating what do they do? Do they see, you know, a psychotherapist of this or that? They tried a psychotherapist for a while. It wasn't doing, it wasn't making any difference. And she was on some medications and she was still having these violent thoughts towards her sister. Now these, according to the parents, the kids grew up loving each other, no problem. So she asked me to look at the house, to clear the house is what she says. And I'm remote viewing the house and I see three ghosts and a dark entity next to this young girl. These, this dark entity was reptilian in nature and he was teaching these three ghost souls, these three former humans, how to torment and torture the living. Damn. That's wicked. Yeah. So I removed the three ghosts and I removed the dark entity. They do not come back to haunt the living. But the family has to do some things to make sure that nothing new comes in. It's like, you know, you go to sleep at night and you leave your doors and windows open and the rats come in at night. But if you close your doors and windows, the rats aren't going to come in at night. Um, it's that kind of a concept. So, you know, I followed up with a consultation with them about that. But those three dark entities, the ghosts and this reptilian guy were haunting her. They found her in the dorms. They decided she was easy pickings because when I cross them over, I contain them in a manner. I'm, I'm remote viewing. This is all in the fourth dimension. I, I spend more time in hell, I think, than any other, anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Some would argue that, but, uh, but, yeah, but right? literal hell. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So I'm questioning them and I, I am, they cannot escape my grasp and my spiritual team. And these three ghosts were telling me that the entity had captured them in the fourth dimension and this is what they were supposed to do and if they did not comply they would become abused that soul energy would get abused so it's no different than a third dimensional kidnapping if you really think about it yeah yeah that checks out as above so below right yes exactly well what about so when you banish these things where do they go fourth dimension that's basically hell Okay, I I never banish, and oh. that's okay. And this is I'm gonna I'll give you my logic trail because I study a lot, and I I I have literally I feel like I put my life on hold to figure this out because it's so important. I never banish, cast away, bind, or bury any spirit, soul, or any dark entity, because what happens is if we cast away these entities. If I were to cast them away, what's to stop them from becoming your problem? We we have a ranch out here. My wife and I live on 12 acres and I've been pulling the same damn snake out of our chicken coop about six times now, I think. I just did it yesterday. So my idea on this as well, and I've got, you know, I put some videos up on TikTok, whatever, because I do relocate the snake. And my whole point with this is, is I'm terrified of them. Even though I know this one in particular is not venomous, it's not going to hurt me. It's still, I don't care for it. But um, it's not my right. I don't, I don't feel it's my right to kill this thing. And a lot of people were saying, we'll just drive it down the road and drop it off, you know, like a mile or two away. And to your point, Point, the answer I give is I'm not going to make my problem somebody else's problem. You do this also with like gophers and stuff like that. You just kind of relocate them on your property or you figure out a better way of dealing with them if you don't want to kill them. And so that's why the snake and I just kind of go for a dance, you know, a lot. Yeah. And, and you're right about that. And this is slightly different in the sense that when we leave our physical bodies, our time here is done and we need to go home. The snake, is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful metaphor because you're right. It becomes your neighbor's problem. Um, but I don't banish them for that reason or cast them away. I don't bury them because when you bury something negative in the earth, what does that do to the earth? It lowers the vibration of the earth. Um, I don't bind them and put them in a container and take them home. I've heard all kinds of things because they can break free and it's not it's, it is not my spiritual jurisdiction to do those things to those elements. If I were to instead hand them off to my spiritual team, that is their job, not my job. That's above my pay grade. 
So by handing them off to the higher level benevolent beings for processing, this is going to kind of fix this problem that we find ourselves in. You know, which leads me to the question, why you? Like, why doesn't the spiritual team just take care of it? Or why don't these light beings just take care of it and let us live the experience that we were sent on earth to live with this interference or impedance? Um, like I said, I, they wanted to know what this experiment would look like. I think the other part of it is, is they do need, at this point, a mortal on hand because their frequency is so high and their the uh, lower realms, it's, there's all kinds of beings, the hat men are, are so low, they almost like need a middleman at times. And when they interfere with mortal man, when these dark things interfere with mortal man, that gives me spiritual jurisdiction to have my team remove them. If they're not interfering with the living, then there's nothing I can do. They're, they're not interfering. So if somebody were to come into your house and rob you at gunpoint, right? It's, it's the same concept, like you said, as above, so below. You know, spiritual um, jurisdiction should be a T-shirt that you put out. That's a great, great T-shirt you know right what? there. That's a really good idea. I'm going to talk to my manager, Judy, about that. Tell, tell Judy, <laughs> and you know what? The only thing I want is one of them. Just send me one, okay. and we'll call All it right. even, okay? That, that love, idea is on the house. I love okay. it. Uh, yes. Or, you know, start a band and spiritual jurisdiction. That's a great name all around. So, you know, uh, my family, my family and I always have these things. Oh, that'd be a great band name. So I, I say it all the time yeah. on the show. I know that I know the audience is sick of it. So, at least one show, there's something like spiritual jurisdiction, which is a dope name. You just have to call that out. Um, you know, it it is to the idea though that that there is this dualistic nature that's a battle that we need to be a part of. Do you think that that may be part of the experiment that they're kind of watching play out as to see how we can handle or interact with it? Or is that part of the test and experience? I do. And there's a lot of karma involved in this. And karma isn't good or bad. It's just seeking balance. So when we, the karma involved, so let's say, for example, we've all, every profession has one. But, you know, let's say that there's a police officer who shoots this kid or whatever, and he doesn't remember shooting a kid. And I've heard this story from several people because something took over his body. Police officers live, they don't live, they work in very low frequency areas, nature of the job, right? Um, and sometimes they can get inhabited or taken over and they don't remember. So what is that free will? It's, it's tough. It's not mine to judge. I never go in judging any situation. I can't. When the concept of karma actually is something I wanted to talk to you about as well, because I just have a different idea about or observation about it. And like I said, this is just an observation. Um, so I'm under the impression that just like, again, uh, Neil Donald Walsh says, um, we're, we live in a, in a, we operate under two modes and that is fear and love. And that is it. Uh, are you under that as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So to that point, then my understanding of karma then would be kind of the the standard traditional. You know, you do good, you get good. You do you don't do good, you get bad. Right. It, in my mind, if we live in in this love fear relationship with things, then it that version of karma is one hundred percent rooted in fear, uh, which is a choice. Right. You have the choice to live in love or fear all the time. Karma in that way is fear-based 100% simply because you only do good to get good in return because you're scared of not getting good, or you do good to avoid bad because you're scared of bringing bad. Both are, like I said, 100% rooted in fear. So the the word karma, does do you think that that means something different for from your definition of it? So it means more balance, right? It's balance. So, and I've done, I do past life regressions with clients and I cross over the dead. I had a client whose brother was murdered and I did a past life regression with her. And in this past life, and it was kind of complicated and it took, it took a while, but long story short, the brother was murdered. He did not cross over, but during the past life regression with my living client, we found out that his murderer and he have been murdering each other lifetime after lifetime. Damn. Once we crossed him and the murderer over because they were both had died, they are now in the hands of God's source and they can sort it out up there. So they don't have to keep playing the same game over and over and over. It's just a game. 
it's interesting the need for intervention. This is this is the thing I find most interesting about your perspective is the need for intervention or the need that if this isn't done, then horrible things either continue to happen or progress in in an exponential way. It it's an interesting concept. Is it what I'm again? What I've what I've kind of looked at from my perspective would be that it's it you just return to source. There's only one other place to go. There's no skipping through dimensions. It's from here to source. But again, I could I always reserve the right to be wrong. I'm I'm not clear on a hundred percent of this stuff. I'm just wanting if some that clarification. Was the case, there would be no ghosts, right? And this is what's interesting too. I mean, because in it. It could be that there are ghosts or spirits, which, again, it's the confusion after death that I'm fascinated by, because how can something not know that it's dead? But there is this really cool conspiracy theory that we all died and we're living this amnesia, you know, in 2012. That That's a fun one. Um, well, I'm, yeah. So great, great question. How does somebody know they're not dead? There's a lot of reasons. One, they are walking down the street and a tsunami hits them and they suddenly get ejected out of their body or they're driving their car, motorcycle down the freeway and a car hits them, they're ejected out of their body. Or they are so sick and ill and weak, they just leave their body and they don't know they've left their body. I, I mean, I could go on and on and on about why people don't know they've died. Um, and they're usually surprised. And so when I work with a client, I, I do a few things. The first thing we do is we cross over any dead together. So you and I work together I'm not going to say, oh, gee, your son, your grandma's here, dear, this or that's here, because how do you know that's true? So when I work with a client, I work with them directly and we work as a team to see what's there. So I'm teaching them sort of how to remote view, but it's a little different than exactly remote viewing. And oftentimes they find that a loved one hasn't crossed over. I worked with someone a couple of weeks ago and, and I have permission to share these stories because I will say, wow, this is so profound. Can I share this? If they say no, then I don't. So I just, there's a confidentiality there. Um, her husband died and left her with three little ones after a heart attack. And he didn't want to leave the family. So he did not cross over when the light came to him. He was playing basketball with his buddies and he had a heart attack at the ripe old age of 39. And he left behind three little girls and he, he didn't want to go. But the problem is, is when we leave this physical body, our karmic time here is done. It's time for us to go home so we can assimilate and absorb the lessons learned in this lifetime. So by him staying there, he's actually earning some negative karma because his grief as a ghost is so great that it's affecting his family. He's not doing it to be cruel or mean. His grief is so great. He loves them. But now the mom and the girls don't know what is their grief and what is his grief. And 100% of the time when I cross somebody over like this, the living person says, oh, my God, I feel so much lighter. Always happens. And what also ends up happening is their living person's level of depression leaves. They, you still grieve because life won't be the same. But the grief is different. They can grieve with a little bit more objectivity they don't they're not wallowing in sorrow and sadness all the time and it doesn't mean that a grief wave won't hit i talk about with my clients a lot the year of firsts when a significant loved one dies that year of first is so traumatic the first christmas the first um halloween the first birthdays the father's day da, da, da. that year of first is really hard because all of those family traditions are gone forever and that's tough. And then when you have that ghost experiencing that with you, it makes it even more full of despair, for lack of a better word. And it is also interesting that souls, number one, don't know they're dead, like in Beetlejuice, you know, when they fell off that bridge. Spoiler alert, guys. Right. Um, then, <laughs> you know, they the movie came out like 20 years ago. Get over it. Watch it. Uh, you know, they, they walked home and then they didn't know they were dead. They had to figure that out later. Um, it, it's that idea that I find very, very interesting. And it seems, 
like I said, I it's more comforting to me because you kind of upset my comfortable apple cart that I had, you know, as far as this I'm idea sorry, that I, I was. No, 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 it's it's <laughs> fine because it's it's a necessary part of the process, right? And and I just love the ideas, so this is wonderful. It it's just that I I felt so great. I was just like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm just going to go back to source, and there's no other place to go. I'll know instantly when I die. Uh, and there's no bad karma that I can build up from having amnesia of the fact or being oblivious to the fact that I died because I didn't know. And so now I'm accruing this negative debt, you know, as far as spiritually goes and affecting the people around me because I refuse to understand that I'm dead. It, it Like I said, in, in my mind, I had this comfortable like, oh, cool. Right after we die, there's instant awareness. We're returned to source. Boom. We do whatever we want. Uh, and this is awesome. So the fact that, number one, that there's a spiritual war going on scares, scares the crap out of me. Um, number two, that we can have the amnesia and just kind of wander around these uh, disembodied spirits. Uh, that kind of sucks. And then there's entities here that affect your the concept of free will, which also sucks. So, um, Laura, uh, you're, you know, this is all horrible news so far. Um, to be honest with you, I, I had this great, comfortable <laughs> existence going on, and here you come, and you're just like, nope, it's all wrong. You're screwed. <laughs> Knowledge is power, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one more thing because I'm being told to say this. Um, the voice is in my head right now. I, no, I love this. I've had several folks on the show do this, and I always think it's so fascinating because I don't experience stuff like this, but I'm fascinated by it. So my apologies. I, I didn't talk, mean to interrupt. Thank you. Thank you. I, I need to talk a moment about suicide. Suicide is contagious, and suicide victims never cross over. They do not cross over because their vibration was so low they cause self-harm. It's one of the lowest forms of, of death we can experience. And I'm not saying this to be judgmental. I'm saying this because we need to know. When a soul commits suicide, they are very depressed. They are usually haunted and puppeted by these dark entities also. So when they die, their grief and despair is so and their guilt because now they're feeling guilty about what they did and they can see their loved ones grieving it's like you were they're in a huge fog bank and i have been i've with souls who've committed suicide in that fourth dimension with them the fog bank is so heavy they can't see the light coming for them it's it's like anybody who's ever been in a really heavy fog bank and you can't see your hand in front of your face that's what it's like for them. And eventually the light fades away. So if you know of anybody who's committed suicide, if you go to my website, thekarmicpath.com under services, there is a free crossing over prayer and it works. You take a moment, you can download it. You can print thousands. I don't care how many, this is a spiritual service here. Print that off and get in a quiet moment. And maybe it's with your family and loved ones and when you call your loved one's name, they travel at the speed of thought and they pop in like that. Say that crossing over prayer, talk to them and tell them it's time to go home. Request angelic teams to come in to escort them to go home. This way, the grief and despair and the depression they were experiencing in life and the haunting they've been experiencing in life, they're experiencing in death, it only stops when they go home. Cross them over. That is a huge spirit. It's soul changing. You are changing the trajectory of your loved one's soul for an eternity and for the better. It's a really big deal. This to me is the highest form of spiritual service a mortal person can do cross them over and you'll find that as you cross them over you start to feel better too and for anybody out there thinking of doing such a thing uh don't you know your life is way more valuable than you think you've got way much more to contribute uh don't don't miss a sunset because of that nonsense you you've got a home uh, if you need anything reach out in fact um reach out and we'll we'll talk about it but do not do that uh you're you will be missed and if nothing else you'll be missed by me so um let me let me ask you then about whenever you do quantum healing hypnosis what is that all about that's pretty cool so a lot of times people are stuck in an element of their life let's say they can't seem to get past 
a career move or they're stuck with, they keep finding the same boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife over and over and over, right? Looking for love and all the, you know, same faces, but not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Great song. Or, or they have a chronic health problem that they can't quite kick. So when we do, when I do a QHHT or even a regular hypnosis, I do a couple different types of hypnosis, depending on what the person needs. What we're doing is we're looking for a past life experience that has hung them up somehow. Um, and it could be almost anything. I never know where a person is going to drop in with a past life. I've had people who dropped in in the middle of an alien abduction and they have been, they're being experimented on. Damn. That's where they dropped in. I mean, crazy stuff. I've, yeah, and I've also had, you know, more normal ones where people are, you know, they're in the middle of a potato field or whatever. Um, but that past life experience, when you get that knowledge about something like that, it can help you to heal. And then part of the, hypnosis is we do work with the higher realms for healing. So if somebody has, you know, carpal tunnel, for example, they can make that go away. The body wants to be healed. The body does not want to be ill. Part of the issue is you have to consciously want it also. So many of us have had these programmings as small children, right? So we have to deprogram ourselves. And I work on that through the hypnosis also of those childhood deprogramming aspects of maybe not being worthy or something like that. And so with the hypnosis and the healing, it can be life-changing and every case is different. Everyone is different and every experience is different, but I have yet to have somebody who wasn't you know, satisfied with what their outcome was. And I'm going to be linking all the ways to find you, your website, of course, and your book uh, down in the show notes here, guys. So down in the show description, you guys know how to do this. You're great at it. Just hop on down there, and that's how you can find Laura. Um, you know, an analogy I was thinking about just based on what you're saying here is that it, it's almost like the third-dimensional reality or this area, Earth, let's say specifically, is like a playground. And it's like we're just children down here that don't remember anything. We don't know anything of the higher consequences of the quote-unquote real world. And I'm going to say real world to, from their perspective, economics, uh, jobs, you know, dealing with the boss, uh, relationships, um, car trouble. These are things children don't understand. But the car trouble in this instance could be um, spiritual baddies. Or you've got economics, which is the politics between the light and the dark frequencies. And then you have higher source stuff like wealth or big government or something like that, that the, these are all just concepts out of our perception from our limited, almost youthful mind, you know, it, as far as this goes, our youthful understanding about how the world works. Because for us, it's just play, you know, it's just, we're down here, we're, we're on the swings, we're on the jungle gym, we're playing tag, whatever. And we don't have a sense of these higher concepts until later on in life, the afterlife, I'll put in air quotes, uh, in, in this analogy. It, it's just that's a way that I'm kind of visualizing what you're talking about, um, because, again, I this sucks. You know, I, I would really hope to just go back to source. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm working on talking you back but into you that idea. That, here's the deal. Now we know. Knowledge is power. Now that we know, we know where to go. We know not to stay in limbo. We can request angels to cross us over. We incarnate here for the experiences our souls need on this mortal journey. Um, along the way, we're getting all kinds of things happening too. Um, I did a, I, somebody bought a house and they had a ghost baby there and also a cool uh, name for a band, by the way, right. Ghost yeah. baby. There yeah. you go. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> or your first album for, you know, uh, spiritual okay. jurisdiction. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be the, the title song. The single, yeah. <laughs> so there's this ghost baby is in their house and it turns out the ghost baby came from a couple houses down and this it was a six month old baby that had died and the new owners had no idea um you know that they got this bonus material basically right when they bought the house but the ghost baby was explaining to me something that was so eloquent he was about six months old he died from exposure on a swing set because his parents were so high they forgot about him this was in ohio i think damn don't do drugs i know right i mean you hear i hear crazy stuff well 
and I felt so bad. And it's hard for me sometimes to have that, not have detached compassion, because when I go in, it's all about de detached compassion, get the job done, move on. But this one was a tough one for me. And this ghost baby says, no, I chose this. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, I was my parents' opportunity to do something different and they failed. Damn, spiritual like, sabotage. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> right? we had him out. Okay. It's like, it, wow. It is though. And it's these types of choices, like why we're here. So do you think maybe that the whole thing, the whole thing is lined up to be an experience that we're meant or choose to have with the knowledge that this is what's going on? So in, in this model, in this idea, you whenever new souls come here, new babies, they've got to pass through those dimensions. You just came from higher consciousness. You're aware of what you're- consciousness. Or lower, lower consciousness. Okay, yeah. or lower. That's right. Uh, you came from one of the conscious I. Is that the plural for conscious? Right. Okay. Yeah, one of the different realms. And, you know, there's a political hierarchy in every realm and every dimension. It's not just, just here in the third dimension. Bureaucracy. Yeah. Um, you know, exactly. Yeah. Bureaucratic tape exists everywhere. Son so I know you think that we're going to get out of it. Guess what? <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was hoping it was just here. <laughs> Damn it. All right. Yeah. One of the best things we can do, and I don't want to leave everybody, you know, scared and all this and stuff, but the idea is to have these conversations. These dark entities have been left unchecked for many millennia. Um, and we can look at World War One. Um, and World War II, and you know, we see Hitler. Hitler was voted in by one one vote. One vote got that guy in, right? If somebody um, just would have complimented on his artwork, you know, it'd be a totally you. different place. I know. So, as we're dealing with this, the dark side works through us a lot of times, but they act like they're light beings. So, for example. One of the, the, the biggest misnomers out there is the concept that sage can, you know, clear ghosts and all this other stuff. That's not the reality. What it is, a sage is has its purpose. Don't get me wrong. It's a good it's a good tool. It's a powerful tool, but it doesn't have the spiritual horsepower to cross over these dark entities or ghosts or something. It's not what its purpose was. But the dark side says, oh, imparts the knowledge upon us. Use sage. So it's like it's a fake um, it's a fake thing to do to make us think that we're doing what we think we want to do. Yeah, it's shenanigans. Shenanigans, there you go. Yeah. But so now what people don't ask this question, why was the Christ child gifted gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Why was the Christ child gifted tree sap? Right? No one ever asked that question. Gold makes sense, right? It's worth money. But Frankincense, gold, and myrrh are all very high frequency substances. So when the Christ child came here, he needed to have high frequency substances because he knew he was in for a battle when he came down here. Christ did not come here to die for our sins for billions of people down the road. He came here to mitigate the karma caused by the Lucifer rebellion. That makes a little more sense, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And so do you think then that that would hold true for all of the um, ascended masters, as they're called? I know I've heard them called that, like for Krishna and Buddha and Mohammed and um, Moses and all that. They're basically like a super friends. Yeah, they're they're trying to mitigate the damage caused by the Lucifer Rebellion. And the Lucifer Rebellion is my loose term for all of these dark entities. Um they're trying to stop it, but it got so out of control, it's hard. And they have so many humans and these dark entities can slice and dice soul humans up, which is gets back into this whole super soldier concept and MK Ultra and things like that. When I am working with crossing over the dead, a lot of the times I'm finding soul pieces. Damn, like a soul foot? Yeah, or just they're like flakes. Like um, to me, they look like, uh, ashes or embers that are just sort of gently floating around. Oh, like an in game, the Avengers movie, whenever they were like, Phew. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, there, and there's so much reality in these movies, it's kind of scary. Film oh, people yeah. Knew. Uh, yeah. Um, so, by collecting those and I hand them off to my team, they take them. It's above my pay grade. I'm just, you know, I'm just a foot soldier. All right. That's all I am. I'm nothing more than that. And they, the higher realms can 
figure out how to put those pieces together. If the person is living or maybe they're up there or I don't, it's their job to do that. I don't do that. And I had in my notes here, ruin sage for me because I love sage. Um, and it's something that I just love the smell of it. I don't necessarily do it for that reason, but I love it. But it's, it's great, right? It's mm-hmm. great for sausages and ceremonies and it smells fantastic, Yeah. but it's not going to um, dissolve a reptilian. Of okay. course not. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. That checks out. Yeah. Okay. That's, what I'm, that's where I'm going with that. And so people will say, oh, I cleared my home. I, I, I saged my house. <clears throat> well, what does that do? If you've got a bunch of dark entities in your house, it's not going to do anything. And I'm saying this because of my sage experience. When I was trying to figure things out years ago, I'm trying everything. Literally, our house was so haunted with these dark entities. It was beyond belief. I I can't even, I could, something I could even imagine. And I've got my six-year-old daughter uh, who at the time, was at six years old at the time, who they are targeting her like crazy. I literally stopped working. I mean, it was so bad. And one night in the beginning of all of that stuff, she comes racing down the hall and she, I swear she like leapt 20 feet and landed in our bed. And I grabbed her and I could feel her little heartbeat like all over her body going and she, and she comes in and she goes, mommy, mommy. And she goes, the, the bad shadow men, because that was her term for it, are in my room. And I could hear them telling me that they're going to take my soul so it will crush you. Nope. This is why we don't have kids, by the way. They're creepy. Go uh, on. Or, yeah. And I'm like, what? and then she says, what does it mean to take my soul? And why do they want to hurt you? I was so scared. Uh, what do you do with that? Yeah. And you know what? For the longest time, I slept with my daughter and I slept with one eye open. The terror and and the physical marks and the beatings that I took from these unseen entities trying to stop me. And I didn't know what they were trying to stop me from. I know it now. Fast forward and you get these answers, right? Yep, yep. Um. I justified that two consecutive hours of sleep a night was a good night's sleep. That's how bad it was. And that went on for years. Um, But it was my proving ground, my training ground. I came in with this contract. I know this now. I came in with this contract to do this work. My life as a teacher is enabling me to do this work. It's all related. My ability to remote view came from a family trip to the Getty Museum where I'm I'm able to cross over, see the dead at this point and, you know, cross them over. And our family goes to the Getty Museum and I get so sick. I have no idea what's going on. I told my husband, I said, look, I'm going to go outside and just sit down. And I get outside and there's like this grassy knoll area between the two buildings of the museum. And I, um, I just sit down on the grass and the next thing I know, I am locked down. I am pinned, this grown woman in her forties, pinned down to the ground and I can't get up. I can't even get my phone. I can't even talk. They have me so pinned down. I'm like, what the heck? The next thing I know are funneling out all of these ghost children. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, from Genghis Khan era, from the French Revolution era, from, you know, all these different time pieces because the Getty is a conglomerate of different eras. What I didn't know at the time, these were current dead. So when ghosts die, when we die, we die in the in the clothes that we die in, if we don't cross over, that's how we remain. That's how we know if a ghost, if we see a ghost and they're wearing overalls or whatever from the 1800s, we know, right? If they're wearing a Roman uniform, that's when they died, right? And they're in st- and they're usually in these stacks of time. So if it's, you know, 1962 car accident, they're wearing those clothes from the 60s. This is one of the things, right? You never see, or I've never seen, like a warp tour t shirt wearing guy wearing like Jinkos and, you know, some tennis shoes or something like that. Um, You know, warp tour 99 or whatever. You've seen more modern ghosts? 
I have seen more modern ghosts. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because they're always depicted as like 1800s or Roman soldier. Right. Or something oh, no. Like that. Yeah. But in I, reality, I, they're much more modern. They're, they, yes, they are much more modern. Um, it reminds me of another story. Uh, my daughter and I are driving home and the, uh, we're on the San Diego freeway and we just come to a screeching halt all of a sudden. And there's a motorcycle accident on the side. And my daughter says, look, mom, a real, a real live dead person. Oh, not only is it inac factually inaccurate, but yeah. Okay. Right. And so what happened was he died and his soul pops out of his body and he is like looking confused, but he is wearing what he died in. So he's just rocking Harley Davidson and chaps for the all Pretty of eternity. Much, right. Damn. Yeah. It actually is one of those little, what do you call those? Uh, like a vest? Rocket, the little rocket, little motorcycles. The rocket. Oh, crotch rocket. Yeah. Rainbow, crotch rocket. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like a, yeah, a sport bike. Sport bike on the freeway. Go figure. Um, but his ghost was wearing those clothes. And I did cross him over. He did not know he was dead. And then he was really pissed that he found out he was dead. My bike, bro. Yeah. I know. Exactly. Right. And it was about a girlfriend too, I think. So, you know, that's an example of somebody who doesn't a current day. And so if we go through every area has these areas where there's like dead man's curve, right. Or where there's always accidents on the specific part of the road. Yeah. That's because when someone dies there, our subconscious or a conscious self even sees it and we get distracted or something happens and it starts to build up this negative predecessor energy. We can all clear it. We all have the power to clear it. If you have a place like that, where you live, anyone out there, use that crossing over prayer and project your thought and consciousness over there. And it will cross over those souls that are stuck and it will free up that area. So no more accidents happen. Damn, that's cool. So I digressed a little bit back to the Getty. After that incident with all of these children, I realized a couple years later that they were all children that had recently died and they died in costume. Oh. Because what happened is I find myself, I'm watching them. I'm in the movie theater with my kids, right? We're trying to be a normal family. And all of a sudden I leave my body and I'm in these tunnels and I'm rescuing sex traffic kids. I've been doing this since 2013. I had no idea why I was doing it. Why am I in a tunnel? Can it possibly be more, more dead children? Then literally I had no idea up until a couple of years ago, why I was doing this all the time. So removing those souls removes the dark sides, food, food and fuel source. And it is every bit real. Sometimes they're kidnapped. Sometimes they're sold. Sometimes they're born and bred in captivity. I wish you could like remote view where these kids are and like send a squad team. You know, uh, they used to do that in like the nineties, I think, or the eighties, how they would have psychic detectives, you know, and you could just go mm -hmm. stop these people from doing these to these children. It's really, it's really nefarious. Um, the truth is coming out more and more and more. And that's a big deal. Um, and I, I have to believe that all of the work that so many people are doing is making a difference because now we're seeing things we're all going crazy. The frequency is finally rising and people are kind of going crazy. And there's all these different feuds and weird energies happening. And it's because I'm hoping it's like, it's a homeopathic reaction where you take a homeopathic medication. It gets worse before it gets better. That's my theory. <laughs> I like this idea. This is the, yes, yes, yes. This is the theory. We got to get this. We got to take this planet back. This planet needs to be restored to its rightful place. It's a gorgeous planet. If you look at all the other planets out there, this is the rock star of all the planets. Yeah, they're all garbage. We got it going on here. Earth goes hard. We know what we're doing. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I agree. You yeah. know, and it's interesting too when you're doing this in, you know, 20 years or so like that, all the millennials that start dying off, they'll just be crossing over, just walking around bitching about no Wi Fi. You know what I mean? I know. <laughs> uh, or they can't get a latte or something like that. Just kidding, right. millennials, settle down. I'll get know, your hate mail. That's fine. Um, it, it's fascinating what you do. I think it's interesting. So let's, um, let me, uh, tell you a cool synchronicity about your book title in particular. And then I want to talk about your book. So, um, soul tribe, which is very interesting. So how we met is, um, your manager, Judy reached out and said, uh, Hey, your show's like the best show on the planet. I was like, settle down, Judy. And, um, I was like, <laughs> I don't disagree with you, but I'm very humble about it. So thank you. Anyway. So she said, um, I've got, um, 
Laura Van Tyne. She has written this book, and it is called Soul Tribe. Now, what's cool about this is this was a seemingly random uh, connection, right? Uh, your manager reached out to me. I had not yet heard about you, but I'm grateful that we met because you're right on. You're right here, and you're part of the Soul Tribe. Now, why this is interesting is because I call all my listeners and the guests that I have on. You guys are all. We are all part of a Soul Tribe. I've been saying that for a long time now. So the uh, fact that okay. this is what popped up, and then that's the title of your book, which it's a remarkable title and your remarkable book. Um, it's coming out in July 1st, correct? So here in just a little bit? It is. Yep. Okay, we'll, we'll get this out before your um, book comes out. And then, of course, I'll link all the ways to find you and the book in the show notes. So um, it's just a cool synchronicity. So tell me about Soul Tribe. Soul Tribe talks about our souls are supposed to be sovereign. The only thing we ever really own is our soul. We need to protect our soul. We talk about our financial health, our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health. We never talk about our soul health. And that's the only thing we can walk away with. And part of soul tribe is we need to learn how to consciously with intention, build our spiritual team. I deserve to have the best spiritual team out there. Our spiritual team are those guides that assist us on our mortal journey. You deserve to have this best spiritual tribe out there. How do you get it? And it's it could be a huge complicated math equation, of course, but essentially with intention and discernment. When I say discernment, a lot of people will say, oh, well, I talk to my guides and my guides say this or my guides say that. How do you know your guide is your guide and not an imposter? Okay. This is the question. All right. This is a big deal. And this is why those little MFers have so much power over us is because we're just like, oh, you know, unicorns and rainbows, right? What if we can have some spiritual tools to discern who or what is our guide? Yeah, like a spiritual BS meter. I like it. Thank you. Yes, I like that. Too bad the book's already published. Uh, well, already that's gone okay. To uh, on the yeah. house, that's another that's another T-shirt. Another spiritual t-shirt. BS <laughs> meter. Yeah, I'm gonna owe you some books and a T-shirt. <laughs> I got you covered. Don't um, worry about it. That's okay. So one of the tools that anybody can use is when we think we are talking to our spirit guides or our angelic teams or whomever they are. If you visualize yourself pouring a rain of salt over them, even if you can't see them and you sense them, just course, just visualize salt being poured on them because salt cleanses in all dimensions. A dark entity cannot hold its shape under a rain of salt. It shifts into its original form. And if you are working and you're thinking you've got your spirit guide here and you salt him and it turns into, you know, a lower realm entity or something, don't be embarrassed or be shamed. Be grateful be grateful you got that thing out of your hair and then call upon your angels to remove and cross it over right now. The best spiritual tool we all have access to. And by, by the way, our spiritual team is karmically earned. It's a vibration. It's a frequency that we all have different spiritual teams. The best way to gain access and improve your spiritual team is to request angelic help. Angels are here to support and assist us. This is why God source created them. But as children, we are programmed by the churches, et cetera. Well, first of all, they're not a religious dogma. Angels are beyond religion. We're programmed to say, oh, I, I can't impose on my angels. Oh, they, surely they have better things to do. Oh, well, I have to save up, you know, my karmic brownie points for, you know, to ask for this help. Use your angels all the time because angels also earn karma for helping us. If they can help us, they get to ascend in their ranks, their political ranks also. So use them. Okay, you're running late for work. You know what? Okay, angels, I really need a rock star spot right now. Please help me with a parking spot. Go for it. You know, I, I hate buying, I hate buying pants. Okay. It's like my thing. And last weekend I had, I literally had to go buy pants. Okay. A friend of mine's like, okay, this is getting pathetic. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going, I'm going shopping and I'm like, okay, angels, 
find me some goddamn pants, okay? Some to be dungarees, yo. I, I, I'm very real with me. Find me some goddamn pants, okay, angels? And sure enough, I walk in, boom, five pairs of pants later, I'm out the door and I'm back home. <laughs> That's a nice way to do it. Yeah, especially if you're not you know, a fan of it. Use your angels. If you have small children or any, if you have children under the age of 18, if you have small children that can't sleep, request angels fill their room to calm the energy for your child. If you have teenagers who drive, request angels be in their car from the moment they get into the moment they get home. And I have a really cool story about this. So my, one of my daughters, they got, we have three daughters, got her driver's license and she got her driver's license late because she had like this, you know, nine month concussion. It was, yeah, uh, I know, right? Cheerleading. And she it gets is this a sport, concussion. ladies and gentlemen. It is a sport, boy, uh, is it? Um, so she gets her driver's license later than her friends and she's so excited. We get her a car and two days later she gets her license and by, we get her a car, meaning she's making us payments on the car, okay? Um, and she wants to go surfing with her friends. And we're like, yeah, absolutely. So it's Saturday morning, da, da, da. Friday night, I like, no, you can't go. I'll drive you. I let, there's something that bad that's going to happen. I'm feeling it. And she's like, by the way, you would have thought World War III erupted in our house, okay? <laughs> Mom, you're being so weird. Stop being a psychic. Stop. Da, da, da. And I just want to be normal. And, you know, one of those. I'm like, okay, but there's something that's going to happen to you. And I don't know what it is. And I know it's not your fault. And I let her go. And I said, okay, so you're going to, she, they're going to leave her like they're surfing in the morning and it's like two exits on the freeway. And then she's off the freeway. I get a, we get a call from her 10 minutes into her ride. She was hit by a drunk driver. Oh my God. Before she left, I packed her car with angels and she was hit in the back corner and the CHP guy was when we got there minutes later he says, I don't know how her car didn't flip or roll or spin. Look at this point of impact. And according to my daughter, the car just glided to the side and came to a stop. I love That's stories like power this. of angels. Yes. Use them every day. Put them in your car. I've got a crappy boss. You know what? Help me angels say wise words when I'm dealing with my boss or whatever it is. Use them all the time because the more you use them, the more you connect to God, the more you connect to the divine, the more you raise your frequency. Use our angels, use them all the time. They cannot do things for you like make someone love you because then we're violating, you know, Joe's free will or whatever. But use them respectfully, use them within the confines of spiritual law. It's fascinating. And yes, I, I can imagine your daughters are probably like, oh, mom, stop it. But then you're right all the time, which sucks for them. I mean, I couldn't do it because you hate when your parents are right, right? Oh, <laughs> and, I know. And I know. Especially <laughs> since you're tapped in. That sucks. It is just unfair for these poor girls. I feel bad for them. Um, it, it's fascinating, though. It's very, very interesting. So I want to ask you something, and I feel like I have to say this with all due respect, only simply because I'm a bit of a philosopher in this way, and I've been curious about this. Like I said, I'm just it's my opportunity to kind of ask you the questions that I want to ask you, right? So what if all of reality is based on everyone's individual perception? So therefore, my idea and concept of that we just return to source and none of the stuff that you're talking about exists doesn't affect me or exist for me. The only thing that does affect what you actually believe in. So the people that believe in Christianity and that that's it, and that there's hell and heaven, then that's it. And they do create that and experience that because that's what they choose to believe and subscribe to. The people that believe that the earth are flat, it's flat for them. The people that believe the opposite of that, it's true for them. The only reason I'm asking is because if there is this idea of that this experience is kind of tailor-made for us, then the concept of new information coming in and altering your perception uh, would then lend to the idea that you do literally create your reality in any way. One example that I've heard of is uh, people who've had uh, near-death experiences, and they die and they go to a different place, Some, but everybody goes somewhere different. And so I even had a um, lady named Jojo Seabacher on the show. She's an uh, astrologer, fascinating uh, young lady. She's got an incredible story. The point is, is that she's had five near-death experiences. Every single one of them were different. She went somewhere different and experienced something different. 
some people who are Christians in this life say that they died and came back. Now, when they died, they went to hell and they were very confused about it. But maybe they created the experience of going to hell because they thought that they should or they had that idea or it's based on their conditioning. Maybe there's some bastard out there with 72 virgins right now based on that ideology because that's what they chose. Yeah, so our religions program us. So I I can't tell you how many people I cross over because they were told from their religion they weren't worthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy. So God, surely God doesn't want me there. So that's why I'm here. I had, okay, I, I get a lot of that. Religions are the best ghost creators ever, unfortunately. That's, yeah. I mean, it makes sense because there's yeah. it's such, it's so confusing, right? They were told one yeah. thing, they experienced life another way. And by their observation, they shouldn't be in hell, but there they are because of their conditioning or their upbringing. We, we look at, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on one institution right now. You walk in the front doors and there's the sign of the tortured Christ. Yeah. That's always fascinating. Okay. So now that's a black magic tool. In my opinion, that's complete black magic. What that does is you walk in there and you are looking at the perpetual torture of an ascended master. Yes. Now we're feeling guilty. We're feeling not worthy. So the earlier depictions of Christ, he's sitting there with his palms up and out. Our hands are an energy source. We're taught to pray like this, aren't we? This closes off our energy. What if we pray this way? Prayer is talking to God. What if we pray with our hands open? How does that change our connection to God? A greater source, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and there, Bill Hicks actually had a really funny observation about this. A comedian, Bill Hicks, he died a while back. Um, but he had a funny observation about uh, people wearing crosses, right? And Christians specifically. He said, when Jesus comes back, do you ever think he's going to want to see another cross again? He said, it's kind of like <laughs> he said it's kind of like walking up to Jackie O'Nassis with a rifle pendant on, you know? And it's like, just thinking of John, Jackie, just thinking of John. Bill Hicks, rest in peace, right, man. Right. We'll miss you. Um I, I love this. I think that you're, uh, what you're doing is great. And thank you for being the foot soldier. Uh, appreciate your service. Um, and it, it's fascinating what you do. I cannot wait to get a hold of your book. I'm very excited to read it. And um, I am, I, I think that you and I have much, much, much more to talk about, but I think that we're probably going to wrap it up for this time. So if you want, you're part of the soul tribe now. So if you'd like, we would love to have you back on uh, at some I would point. I'd love to. I love your questions, by the way. And by the way, for anybody out there, always question. Absolutely. Don't ever, t don't ever have a psychic tell you, I was told this and this by a psychic. Always question the psychic you're talking to. How do they know what they're talking to or dealing with? How do they know these things? How do they clear and clean themselves between clients? Yeah. Yeah. Is it just like a Doctor weird, do it? like a small little spiritual horse bath or do they really do it, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, ask questions. Never stop asking. I never stop asking. I, I, the knowledge I have is a drop in the bucket. Did your never, section? Yeah. Never stop asking. Never stop asking. You have to. It's a constant evolution and um, cognitive exercise. So uh, did you happen to call the, did you write about Sage in your book? I have not. I talk about it when I'm out speaking a lot. I have another book coming out called Karmic Intrusions, and it will have that in there. Okay. I've got a subtitle for that chapter. Sage, okay. Sage Wisdom. Oh, there you go. All right. You know, you're good. Any other you... uh, bangers like that? I got you covered. You know, I'm just going to call you. Were you in marketing <laughs> at some point? <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's like, I'm honestly, it feels sometimes like I'm channeling dead crazy people. Like it's just this spur of ridiculousness. So, but it, it. sometimes it works out in my favor. Um, so, uh, Laura, thank you so much. I'll be linking all the ways to find you. Of course, your book comes out July 1st. We are very excited about it. Soul Tribe. It's got a dope cover on it, too. That thing looks awesome. It, you know, it does. I, I love this cover. Uh, I have to hand it to, to my manager, Judy. This, is, this was her concept. Um, it's Soul Tribe, Navigating the Spiritual War. And I will make sure you get a copy of it as soon as it comes out. 
thank you. I appreciate it. I can't wait to get my hands on it. And of course, I'll, I'll feature it in a, in a post here as well. So all the ways, of course, like I said, are going to be linked in the show notes there. Um, Laura, I can't thank you enough for your time. This was for your time. This was great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This Absolutely. has been a blast. So thank you. Well, we'll do it again soon. Your soul tribe, like all I right. said. Sounds good. All righty. Take care. Thank you. A massive thanks to Laura Van Tyne for spending some time with us on the show today. Uh, all the ways to find her, of course, guys, are down in the show description. Check that out. Her new book, Soul Tribe, is out July 1st, so make sure to pick up a copy of that. Uh, it's fascinating. Fascinating work. Very interesting conversation. Like I said, I've got way too many questions to um, only do this one episode with her. There's just a lot to unpack there, and I'm grateful for her, her time, and her wisdom and coming on the show to share that with us. So as far as this show goes, guys, you can find us at expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where the links to all of the socials will be. If you want to see the YouTube video of this or any other show, go find it at uh, YouTube or go to the website. There's a YouTube link directly from there. It's kind of a one-stop shop for all the socials. Patreon is there. So if you find the show valuable and you want to contribute more than liking and sharing, which you guys are already doing a wonderful job at, and I'm extremely grateful to everyone, Um, then you can do that through Patreon. So uh, as far as the music that you're hearing underneath this, uh, that is Vinny the Saint. Uh, How to find him is linked directly in the show notes, guys. Go check Vinny out. Great friend of mine. He makes some incredible music. So check him out. Uh, Let him know you found him on the show, and he'll be excited about that. He's a great guy. Uh, In this week, guys, go out into your world and uh, pick up a piece of litter. Um, Pet an animal of any shape, size. Uh, Just be careful, you know, out there. Uh, As well as buy somebody a coffee or a meal in line behind you. It's never too late, you know, to just do something nice for somebody. Open a door. Uh, Get out of the left-hand lane. That's a big one. You can just start there. Start there. Stair-step into the buying somebody a coffee or something like that. Get out of the left-hand lane. Uh, beyond all of that, guys, incredibly grateful for Laura for her time, incredibly grateful for Vincent for his music, and incredibly grateful for you, the listener, uh, for spending some time with us each week. So thank you, bottom of my heart. Go out into the world this week, guys, and just be good to one another. We'll see you next time. <laughs>